You're listening to the Emissary Authors Podcast, where we help faith-driven founders and entrepreneurs tell the stories that matter. This episode was made possible in part by the Emissary Author Workshops and our title of the week, The Hope of War, from Emissary Author Larry Cripps. Go to publishwithemissary.com forward slash workshops and thehopeofwar.com for more details. It's the Emissary Publishing Podcast with my friend and colleague, Paul Edwards, where we speak with founders and executives and the authors who serve them. Paul, my friend, good to see you again. Great to be back again, Jason. And uh, we've got, uh, in my mind, um, one of the sharpest minds out there today in terms of digging to the root of who you are in a variety of contexts, he does it with personal development for men uh, of faith. He does it with uh, people of all stripes for careers. And today we're going to talk about how about his insights into uh, doing it specifically for writers. We're going to talk about the real reason you write. And our guest is uh, our mutual friend, uh, emissary author. And a longtime personal friend of mine through Masterminds, Sam Feeney. Sam, welcome to the Emissary Authors Podcast, my friend. How are you? Uh, very well, thanks. Always great to hang out with you guys and uh, be able to get to talk about uh, the real reason we do anything. Uh, that's, you know, always kind of my pursuit of getting layers deeper uh, in whatever we're working on and uh, trying to get to that, that why uh, that Simon Sinek uh, popularized for us. Mm, yeah. And you've like, you've spent a couple of years now, um, you know, when we were, uh, in mastermind groups together, I remember seeing you get it started and you're still chipping away at doing this primarily through the career factors, which was your last book. Now you're working on some new ones, but I was, I wanted to start there because, um, I remember, you know, you experimented with some surveys and, um, an analytical tests that you would send us. And I remember, you know, the questions that you were putting forward were, were profound. So give us a little bit of the background that, you know, was there, was there a, a long season of experience that led you to say, I can really help these people stop working jobs. They hate like what, where did that all come from? Well, it really came from my career as a school counselor. I was a school counselor for a long time and uh, took it upon myself. You don't really necessarily have to put a lot of thought and, and effort into helping kids choose careers. You can just kind of push them out the door to go to college and, you know, wish them well and hope the college takes care of it. Uh, but I really felt a growing pressure to be able to communicate uh, to students in a way that effectively empowered them to uh, take ownership of their career decisions sooner than later, uh, because it was a, kind of a perpetual kicking the can down the road. And uh, one of the kind of most jarring incidents that I had that really woke me up to the need for this, as I remember a student of mine who really went off the rails as a high schooler. And uh, after really not being on a radar at all, ever as being like a bad kid or anything, and we finally pinned him down, uh, not physically, but we finally got a chance to talk to him and his parents. It was the assistant principal and I I'm like, but what is happening? Like, why are like you go from, you know, just going along, being a good student. And now he's, you know, selling drugs out of his car and he's like, just in trouble with the police, all this stuff. Like what happened? And he said, that's the most Frank I've ever heard a kid be. He said with his parents sitting there in the room, he says, I see my parents. And every day they go to work, they come home, they eat dinner, they watch TV, they go to bed, and that's their life. And I figure I've got to, until I'm about 25, until that's me too. So I may as well enjoy life now. Mm. And his, it was this very aware moment for him of what, what he assumed career was. And because that was what was being modeled for him. And I'm like, man, what am I modeling that? for him? Am I modeling it for my kids? Like, I've got to figure this out because generationally we are just doing things a particular way and it's not getting us the result that we want. So uh, I went to kind of, as I like to do, you know, Paul, like just think differently about a, a common problem. And so I went, I, I wondered how we could approach career 
uh, development differently and, mm-hmm. and making choices about careers early. Because that's really when the cement starts to dry for us for a lot of different reasons. And I, I wondered, what if instead of looking at aptitude and what, we, what we're good at as a dictation or uh, divining rod for finding our career, what if instead we looked at motivation? Mm-hmm. And that opened up just a whole different approach to career that has been very helpful for students all the way up through people who are retired now and looking at, you know, I'll call chapter two, looking at the, the next years of their lives after uh, they have had a, a full, you know, 35, 40 year career. And so mm-hmm. that approach has been, has really opened things up and, and fits into uh, a lot of people's lives in different ways. And what's the, what's the difference uh, that, how would you define the difference between aptitude and motivation? Well, because often, I mean, there's a lot of the, of aptitude that's inborn, right? We're going to have, uh, just our, our innate abilities are going to point us in a particular direction. That's good. But I don't know about you, I've gotten tired of doing things that I was good at. Uh, right. I, I, the, you know, the thing that in Gay Hedrick's book, uh, the big leap, he talks about being able to live in your zone of competence. And even in your zone of excellence and that not being necessarily the place where you get the most fulfillment from, Mm -hmm. but your skills are usually, unless they're fostered and really uh, brought to the uh, the highest possible, which work doesn't always do for us, uh, that that doesn't create those flow states. But Mm -hmm. until you do, unless you find that, oftentimes what you've come to hang your hat on becomes drudgery. And so that's, that's where I thought that's one thing, that's one shortcoming of aptitude. Um, and the other thing that I, that I looked at too, in particular in the progression of careers for, for individuals is what we are good at at particular levels doesn't take us to the next level, mm-hmm. whether that's chronologically or that's in, in a, a progression of our careers. And so it just doesn't do all the things that we think it should do, but we don't really, we've never really, I think, flushed out what's an alternative to that? Because it's easier to measure uh, aptitudes and you treasure what you measure. And yep. so that's why I love assessments and <laughs> helping people measure other things like career motivation. So, Well, okay. One quick thing I want to say here, Jason, and I, and I know you got a question to follow. Um, just to bring this home, I mean, I was gifted with languages, you know that, right? And in high school, I despised English class utterly despised it. And, and Spanish, I was good at learning Spanish, but I didn't enjoy the class. Mm -hmm. And I spent years wondering what, what's the use of being gifted with languages if I don't even like doing it. And I found out that the, the motivation part of it was not the language itself. It was the ability to interpret it for people who didn't understand to make the complex Mm -hmm. understandable. And the skill was the means to do the motivation. So yes. when I'm, when we go, when we went to Costa Rica, right, and my bride is relying on me to arrange mm-hmm. parking and tickets and transportation and all that in Spanish, I'm on cloud nine because I'm like, I get to be the go-between. Mm-hmm. And when I'm helping someone write a book, I'm on cloud nine because I get to be the go-between the writer and the audience. Right. But just learning the language for its own sake, I could care less. Right. Anyway, sorry, yeah. Jason, I interrupted. Which makes me think that you're, you're one of your top three career factors is impact, but we can talk more about those later. Right. <laughs> I, I recently saw a video with Bob Proctor being interviewed about how he became successful in assisting people find, in finding their own path for success. And he talked about his early life was plagued with being a underperforming worker. He did enough to get by at work and he was fired a lot. And it really never occurred to him until he had, was uh, taken by the hand by a mentor uh, that he should just he should really give careful consideration to what he wanted his life to look like. What does he want to to see in the future and write it down and think about it? And he he exposes the tendency in I I think for many of us you know you use, you as a as a school counselor, probably have a different, uh, a unique view on this, that we are many times 
that many times the emphasis is on um, being told what to think rather than how to think mm-hmm. and how do we mm-hmm. process our own experience and our experience in our lives doesn't have don't it doesn't have to look like somebody else's and we need to set uh, set an intention for the future and then get about doing that today. Uh, and I think many people that probably you've discovered this in your research with career factors, many people are working in jobs that they fell into. They, it, they just seem to be doing this. And if they don't, if they stop, they wouldn't know what they would do anyhow, but they're really not happy with what they're doing. And they are like the parents of that kid, the parents of that kid, you know, going to work and coming home, rinse, repeat. Mm-hmm. And there's really no li- the, not experiencing the fullness of life, perhaps that somebody else that their kid looks at and says, I don't know, I don't want to end up like that. Then what do I do about it? Right? right. And that takes a lot of effort. And I think it takes one of the things you, you talked about before the broadcast was that you have assessments that you take people through in your work to help them. I'm guessing I'm paraphrasing, but I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth. So <laughs> uh, the, the assessment. What does that assessment process look like and how, what have you experienced as people go through it? Yeah, very straightforward um, process. Um, walking you through, you get kind of get an introduction to the six career factors as you go through this. And it, it really just asks you, uh, you know, like your skill questions on preferences and as it relates specifically to work. And there's a lot of really great assessments that are related to work out there. I'm a big fan of Strengths Finders. Uh, definitely was, you know, really pegged me in terms of, you know, my strengths. But the generalization of a lot of assessments, I think, waters down their effectiveness. And so I wasn't going to pretend like this, hey, this will also help you have a good marriage or this will also help you whenever be a good parent. This is just about work. And so this, the specificity of it is very important to me and be able to do that so much so that I've actually there's a career factors assessment for adults and there's one for students as well. So roughly, let's say 16 to 24 that are awarded differently because the one has the context of working and the other one probably doesn't really have a context of working and being able to, to frame that properly. But the power behind it then is being able to get your results and right away, in particular, if you have work as a context, thinking, oh my gosh, just by naming what, ha- what has been problematic, but unnamed in my life. Now I know why I left that job two jobs ago, mm-hmm. or now I know be- What's, what's funny talking about Jason, the kind of the playbook we get from our parents or the, the playbook we get from school or those around us, those are really big career influences, which I talk about a fair amount in the book, um, just to really, to define like, how did we get here? If, if you don't know that, then it's kind of hard to, to reverse what we've done. But the fun part about that as well is being able to recognize, um, that a lot of people who enjoy their careers also don't know why they enjoy their careers. So they're not helpful either. Yeah. So you can take this career. I'm like, oh my gosh, now I know why I like, I can name why I love my career. And so w- the big thing for me behind career factors is not necessarily to, you know, force you to change your job, but to, to help you just understand more about the dynamics that are going on so that when something happens or when you've got a trail, um, of jobs you did not enjoy, uh, as Paul and I, um, I had him on my podcast a while back. Um, just the idea of like, I, maybe it's me, right? <laughs> maybe maybe all, after oh, five jobs, it, it's here. me. <laughs> well, okay, but what about me? Like, what is it that, that I'm looking for? And so uh, it gives you a recipe for career satisfaction that I've, I've not found uh, very frequently elsewhere. Yeah, uh, I remember that interview, Sam. I, I got fired a lot when I was young. And, you know, only now that you're mentioning the centrality of impact, mm-hmm. do I begin to look at the work I did and say, you know, so much of it was not that it's not good work, not, you know, I'm not looking down sure. on it. It's just, I don't get to make an impact in an environment like that. I make a very minimal impact in, in most of those jobs. And then a job like the military, you make a massive one. Mm-hmm. And, and it is significant and it's recognized so universally by the culture. And yes. so even though I graded against the bureaucracy, because that's another, that's another problem, you know, I, I don't like bureaucracies, mm-hmm. even though I graded against the bureaucracy, 
every milestone I passed, I completed a, a, a full 12 months in combat. I participated in the first free elections in Iraq since Saddam Hussein took power. I, I led this group of soldiers and trained them and taught them, you know, and, and, and improved their levels of fitness and competence at their job. And there was always thresholds of significance and impact associated with that. And then the, the plunge back into the civilian world, mm -hmm. uh, I needed, I needed an even bigger level of impact and it was really hard to find. And there was a multitude of reasons for that, but it's, it, it is very helpful to, to begin to piece that together using language that tells you, are you in a position right now where you are ringing that bell? Cause if you're not, then it doesn't matter how much you get paid. Correct. And, and that's one thing I found in the research too. It's so interesting is that pay, well, I'm a fan of it, right? <laughs> pay only is on the continuum of dissatisfaction. Yeah. It is not on the continuum of satisfaction. So it can minimize, you can minimize your dissatisfaction to a, to a large extent by how much you get paid, but it will never cross that bridge over to the continuum of satisfaction. Um, and so that's one thing that, that I think we, we often go into jobs asking of it two things. I want to be able to do something I am able to do and I want to be able to get paid. Mm -hmm. But because, but because that's not what actually motivates us, even though we don't know that we end up setting up our job to fail us. Mm. And it's much easier to say, oh, well, it's the job's fault. It's the, you know, whatever. And we talk about writing, it's the calling's fault. You know, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's something, you know, I think about Stephen Pressfield, you know, get his butt kicked for 13 years because he didn't know what he was, what he was really getting into. Uh, and so instead teaching now to say, hey, I, I'm going to be gentle about this. But once you know your career factors, it's on you yeah. to make a career that is rich and fulfilling. And the fun part is, Paul, people you worked with at those jobs you got fired from, some of them loved their jobs yeah, because they got, they had a different career factors recipe. Sure. And so they were getting what they wanted from it. And it's that, that's the fun part about this is it, it, it shows up in so many different ways for so many different people. Well, it gets into the title of this talk. The real reason you're right. The real reason we work is not necessarily for the work's sake. The real reason we want money is not to amass money. We do things for the benefit that we want to see. And if we can't name the benefit, the, so the underlying need and want in our lives, then we are prone to chasing after something that is going to be unf unfulfilling because it is not solving it. Well, it might for a short period of time for a dopamine hit, mm -hmm. you know, it's something new, it's something fresh, it's new relationships, whatever it is. Uh, but it's not going to give us long-term satisfaction, even if that were a thing mm -hmm. and couple, you know, they talk about this with couples counseling, you know, couples come in, they're like, I have a communication problems. Like, you know, you don't, you don't have a communication problem. You, you're probably saying the same thing. You're playing, you're saying it in different ways and neither one of you can articulate what the other person is saying and mm -hmm. until you can find the words and the underlying meaning for those words, because not every you know, not every word means the same thing to everybody. Very true. But you can yeah. find the underlying meaning for that word, then your communication, it's, it's going to seem like your communication is off it, when in fact there's, there's something that's missing. And that's what I like about this idea of digging in, uh, with, with assessments to expose a language that can be used to determine what we really care about. And then yeah. once we determine what we really care about, be willing to shuffle the rest of the deck around. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I like the, the self-definition. So step one, take the assessment step. Step two then is to be able to take your, your CF three or your top three career factors and, and really personalize them. I actually, when, when I work with coaching clients, I, I print them out and give them a full sheet of paper, pen, paper, don't do it pretty, just do it and write out, a, you know, if, if you're number one, is relationships, which I think is very important uh, for some people in their in their work experience. Right out, what does it look like, right, to have that? And maybe and, and if it's you can write it from the from the perspective of I had that once, and I remember that 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 halcyon year <laughs> where, where everything was going great, 
or I know uh, another activity I do with with some of my clients is it's called the other side of the coin. I know what it doesn't look like, <laughs> so let, let's write let's write what it you know write what it looks like based on what my experience of of the absence of it. And so, uh, being able to do that 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 clarity of it, I think, is really really important. And and that's one of the reasons why I kept it smaller. Um, because there's only six main career factors, largely because that's where the research really kind of parsed like a, a dividing point of where are we splitting hairs. But also because I want to be able to say, if you and I have the, the opposite career factor combination, I still at least know what yours are because there's only three other ones, right? I've got three, you've got three, and the way, but the way they work themselves out allows us to, to actually create dialogue and communication and understand how it shows up in our lives. And mm. so, yeah, the personalization is, is a really big deal because that's another step in ownership. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking now, Jason, of our lengthy back and forth we've had about understanding each other's strengths and weaknesses. And so, you know, we've, we've primarily done this through the lens of the Enneagram, uh, Sam, but it's, it really is. It's like Jason hates writing. <laughs> Luckily, that's not a problem for me. Right. That's right. I hate uh, marketing and technology and organization and spreadsheets and he's phenomenal at them. And it's, so it's not a, it's not a big lift for him. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's a number of different ways that that plays in that, that, that pencils out. But I think, um, what it, what it does do among in a situation like that, where, where both, where more than one party's involved, but the, the parties are all aware. Okay, this is this is this person's sweet spot, so don't try and take it over. This is their lousy spot, but I'm good at it, so I'm going to tell them just leave that to me. Don't worry about that. I'll handle that. You go do what you do best, and we'll meet in the middle. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm glad to bring that up, Paul. The uh, because I I think back to podcasts, uh, and when I first started thinking about doing a podcast, and this is probably back in 2016, maybe somewhere under. All the technical chops to do a podcast, the space to do a podcast, all the equipment. I could just buy the equipment. I know how to run all of the equipment, know how to do the editing, know how to do everything for a podcast. Hate, hate, hate scheduling people. <laughs> and, and so one of the, one of the critical things to unlock in this, well, actually, I also hate editing. Uh, not that I can't do it. I've done audio mm -hmm. recording and and mastering for, for folks and mixing and all sorts of stuff. Like I've done audio engineering for years. Um, so I can do it. But it was interesting that the wings, on the wings of, of running a podcast was schedule the person, run the podcast, and then edit it and launch it. Two things which I hate. And yeah. so I didn't, didn't get a podcast done. Didn't, year after year, didn't get a podcast. Didn't get a podcast. And then I finally, uh, for work, uh, had, had somebody who worked for me do all of the scheduling. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know who the guests are. They would just uh, get a <laughs> bullet pointed list of here's the things we're going to talk about and all sorts of stuff. And, and it was a great podcast and people listened to it. And then I launched another podcast in, in COVID. Uh, and the whole point of it was, I don't know who these people are. You click a button and you are on my schedule. It just shows up. The whole system follows rules and it's all live. Nothing's edited. So I took away the two impediments mm -hmm. to the thing which I'm I'm okay at, right? The thing that I love and I think I do well at. Took away the two impediments, and I did two hundred something episodes of that, and it's still going on. And uh, and it's interesting that so many times, um, and I don't know what is in my particular nature, but so many times people just exist within the confines of the way they think believe things to be. They, they make the rules right. like yeah, people working in software, for instance, I'm a, I'm a programmer. It's in my nature that if the software doesn't work quite right, I'm like, ah, well, we could change it. We could write a different one, right? Most people are like, ah, well, the system has me do this and the system has me do that. The system is, have you told anybody? No, it's just the way the system <laughs> is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And, and, and they, they take the thing which they can be great at and they just leave the hindrances in place because they don't bother to, to question and really kind of press on the door of what if things could be different yeah. because yes. they can, 
because the rules are all made up and they're made up of by people just like you and me. And, yeah. and I think when it gets to like the, the idea of careers, once people dig in to how they ended up here, uh, and why it's dissatisfying to them and what they really care about, they really have an opportunity then to, to go, okay, well, what if, what if I could change the rules a bit? What, what if I could Correct. remove these hindrances? Can I, can I get myself into a position that I really thrive in? And the answer is, of course you can, because other people do it. And what makes you so deficient? Nothing. Yeah, that's right. Other that's right. Those, 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 those other guys aren't that great. They're just playing by a different rule book. Yeah. yeah. They're, you know, it's the same. I, I teach my, my kids, you know, some, some of their youth sports. And I tell them a lot, especially when you're just starting out, it's the person who knows the rules best who wins the game. It's not the yeah. person who's athletically more talented. And so, oh, that person knew you couldn't do that. So they didn't, you didn't. Um, so it's just trying to, trying to teach people how to reframe where they've gotten. And um, as you said, Jason, not just throw up their hands and say, well, this is just the way it is. You know, that's, that's what most people's response to a job they don't enjoy is pretty simple and pretty universally employed. They lower their expectations. And yeah. I just, life is too long. <laughs> that, that just grates at me <laughs> uh, to think that you, you know, the, the fallacy that this, this is how it has to be. So, so thinking now about, um, the reasons people write, you know, uh, they're, 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 they're manifold in terms of how people verbalize them to us mm -hmm. when we talk to authors. What, what do you think? Like what, what comes to mind discussing, um, motives? Because I think, you know, Jason and I have this conversation all the time about how do we call out the person who has the motive to write? Because if they have the, the correct motive, I think a lot of other things downstream are just going to reconcile, calibrate themselves to that yes. and it's going to flow. And when we do work with an author, that's what we get. We get people who just like, I was talking to our first author today. Um, he doesn't need uh, a whole lot of help from us. He gets it, but he doesn't need it. He, he he's building his own speaking circuit in other States right now. And he's going mm -hmm. and selling tons of books because he has, he's coming at it from the right motive. And the ones that we're working on now, same thing. They've got, they've got the right motive. So, you know, um, let's, let's chat about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. It's the old, uh, old the old adage of you can't steer a parked car. I mean, that's the hardest thing yeah. is to do is the motivation, you know? And, and so what, if you can answer that, then it's okay. Now I just pick my directions. I can, even if I pinball my way through this thing, at least I know, you know, I've got the fuel to be able to, to continue on this journey until I find my sweet spots. And I think the same thing with writing, my journey with writing has, uh, was kind of echoed some of what Jason was talking about <laughs> in terms of pro parts of the process I enjoyed. And cause I was looking at the, I was looking at the how. And so I think I call it the chasm of how you, you get really motivated, you get really fired up and then you get to the edge of the cliff and you look down and you're like, well, I don't know how to span this gap. So I'll just do, I'll come back to it later. Maybe it'll somehow magically be smaller. I like come back to it. But when you have uh, a, a deadline, when you have um, a motivation, and the deadlines, I, when I say deadline, I mean like a, it's something self-imposed. It's something that's, yeah. hey, this, this is something that I get from this. this is something that I, or that something that I miss out on if I don't. That's internal. I call it, I think of that as positive stress. You're putting that on yourself of like, Hey, this is a goal I'm setting for myself. It's something that I want. Therefore, I'm more, I'm more willing to do the things that I don't want to do or, or like Jason, finding solutions around them in order to get to it. And so when I think about what the real reason you write it, I think expanding that for people and being able to one, recognize how much of it is internal, although the, a lot of the writing process is internal and we know that already, but how much of it is okay to say, Hey, I get something from this, mm -hmm. you know, like. I, I think that's part of the writing, uh, de depending on where you come from with writing and, and thinking about, okay, this is my gift to the world or, you know, whatever, but altruism is kind of fun, you know? And so however you come to you, however you come to writing, recognizing that it's okay. I, th I think of, of the idea of, of career motivation and what I'm trying to pin down for people is like the, an alternator on a car battery. 
Like you're running the battery, but as you're running the battery, the alternator is charging it back up. And you can create a virtuous cycle out of this if you are stoking the the proper flames uh, mm -hmm. in your riding. And so the, that's where the career factors, I think, shows up more is, is okay, maybe for me, it's, you know, uh, it's environment, right? And, and working environment is a really big deal because when I write, what's the environment that's ideal for me, right? I'm personalizing that. I'm able to now create that in my life. And that could be ebbs and flows of my schedule or of my writing space or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, if that's, if that's important enough for me, then if I can create that part, even just being in my environment fosters creativity, like I, I'm priming the pump for myself if I know that environment's a really big deal to me. So yeah. that's just a way for writers to have a little bit more self-awareness about why, about why they write so that they can keep pushing that button and get, mm -hmm. get more, you know, get more output if that's what you're really looking for, but, you know, be able to get to pull more out of themselves because there's, there's kind of more to give in that particular style. Yeah. It's, it comes to my mind that many times people talk about how difficult something is to do and how they can't do it when they've never done it. Mm -hmm. And it, it goes, I'm reminded of when I was coaching, uh, in a CrossFit gym and I was teaching, you know, people to lift more weight. And there's a particular move where you take the weight from the ground all the way to overhead and you, and you push your hands all the way up in the air, right? With that weight. Right. And it's an Olympic lifting move. And, and so often people would lift the weight, they lift it all the way to here. And they had one or two more steps to make in that move and they would stop, drop weight. Then they would say, I can't lift it. And I would tell them that is untrue. You already did lift it. You yeah. don't know how to land it. Mm. And because you don't know how to, how it feels to land that much weight, your the entirety of your soul wants to throw that weight back on the ground because you're resistant to two things. One, falling over, like try to fall over, just randomly be like, I'm just going to throw <laughs> myself on the ground. It is a Herculean effort to do it. Your everything is programmed in your body. Yes. Don't fall over. And number two, don't hit your head. It is built in. I don't want to hit yeah. my head. And, and if you think I'm going to fall over, I'm going to hit my head before you even lifted the weight, your body has gone through the thousand movements that micro movements that need to be made to lift it all over your head. And it has been like, and we're shutting this thing down mm -hmm. yeah. and out of which I don't, I can't lift it. And by simply reframing it to, no, I don't know how to land it. People begin to reckon, reckon, recognize what they already can do. And the missing, the missing piece that if they learn that, which in this case, wasn't a very big, you know, big, big thing to learn. Once they learn that, everything else falls into place. Oh, you actually can lift it. And, and it strikes me that many times we are, we're stopping ourselves from moving forward because we've never done the thing that we keep saying we can't do. When in fact, we've done most of it. And there's this one little piece <laughs> That's right. that we just happen to be internally resistant to, which stops everything, stops the entire process before it began. But it takes, I think, sometimes a person from the outside to look at our, yes. you know, our lift, let's say, and go, hey, 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 mm -hmm. stop saying things that aren't true. You're already there. You just yes. need this one last component. Let's work on that. And boom, everything else falls into place. How, how yeah. do you, how do you, how do you experience that people assess their careers? Well, two ways. One, I'm thinking about like when, if you need corrective lenses, like I wear contact lenses, right? If I'm not wearing them. Everything I'm in my office right now, everything in my office is the same, but my perception of them isn't. Pop in contact lenses or put in my glasses and all of a sudden, all of the things that are already there, I can now see with such greater clarity. Mm. And that's one of the things that I, I think helping people to be able to see that and holding in balance at the same time, the, the priority that we, we, you know, that when you say yes to something, you say no to many other things. Mm -hmm. In the same way, I give, I say, you've got a free pass on these other ones. I did, I did a keynote for 400 or so teachers uh, early last year. 
and, you know, going through this whole idea about career engagement and ha- like what, like doing this, we took the assessment live, which was so much, so much fun to see because right away they're getting the results. They're like, oh my gosh, I can, I can, I can see now a little bit more, but I, I went through and just did a survey. Like I would love to hear, you know, how many people here are, you know, your number one is growth. You know, you want like a couple of you raise their hands, whatever. And then, uh, how many people are impact? And a fair amount raise their hands, but not a ton. And I said, those of you who don't, who don't have impact as your number one, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's fine. Like you are not, I mean, most of our lives early on, and unfortunately for some of us in continuing well into adulthood are trying to be other people. Yeah. So, so one, giving clarity, but two, giving them a free pass on the stuff that, hey, I'm not motivated by that. And the guidance to who sits next to me is motivated by that. And we have the same job. And that's awesome. Like, that's one of the coolest expressions of our own uniqueness. Uh, but try to be good at what he's, you know, try to be motivated by why that guy's motivated. It's, you know, really, uh, really short term gains and long term losses. And so freeing people from that paradigm as well is really, I, I think, been really helpful. Yeah. And as long as you can accept going along with that, right. If in the, in the, in the example of teachers, right. If you are not motivated by impact, then there are going to be students who don't like being in your class and that's okay. And then there are going to be students who do that to them. It's like, oh, this is, this class is so easy. I just come in, I do the work, I get up and I go out and that's all I want. Right. And, and I think you need to have a healthy expectation, circling it back to writing, if you're going to spread a message, right? We, we tell authors right away, you are going to be polarizing. There's going to be people. If you want to be read. <laughs> there's going to be people you have no business marketing your book to them. Yes. Because they don't care. And there's going to be other people that they are itching to read your book. And we have to find those people. Right. And that all comes back to the motive that you're bringing to it and the message that you're spreading as a result. And Let's not confuse the two, right? Let's not stick you in a, in a, in a signing event with a bunch of people who don't give a rip. Mm-hmm. Um, cause you're going to hate that. And so are we. Yeah, absolutely. And I think about one of the other ones of the one I just mentioned for career factors is in thinking about how personal the writing experience is. Uh, one of them is growth. One of the career factors is growth. And I think about it with that with writing and thinking about the gift to yourself of writing and how much you have to grow as a writer. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, so if if that's not, that's my number two. So if that's not a career factor for you, if that's not not a career motivation, then then this will sound like drudgery, right? But how much I've had to grow and change through the writing of a book and how much I've, you know, that in and of itself has been the win, right? And then you just turn it over to a marketing team and let them find other people who are interested in that thing, you know, like, it doesn't have to, you don't have to write to get the end result for your reader if your motivation isn't wired toward that. Yeah. And so you can give yourself a, a pass. Like maybe, maybe some people, as they define growth, I are very interested in, I want people who read this to grow. Awesome. Great. They probably will. Or someone else says, I want to grow because I'm writing. Yeah. Great. You probably will. But those two people will approach this very differently. Yeah. But recognizing that there that there's a, an in, an end point that can be reached, it can be reached, and it can be reached by in the particular field you're in. But maybe just by focusing on a, a different element uh, as you are going through that process, uh, that really frees people up to say it's okay that I don't hate this. Yeah. <laughs> Shit. Right. I, I'm not I'm not earning my uh, my stripes by making this drudgery. I can. I can really get a lot out of, of having written and, uh, and then be able to, you know, to take my book and, and be able to market and sell. One of the things we talk about with authors is that, uh, they really want to share a message. If you want to, if you want to write a book, if you want to be a professional author, you want to write fiction or whatever, to tell stories, that's great. Uh, if you want to share a message, uh, a book might be helpful for you in that might not be. And mm-hmm. it, uh, what you're talking about, you know, kind of removing impediments and that recognizing part, parts of the process that you might not be great at. Not everybody writes their own books. I think it's John Maxwell who's got 80 something books out there now. Yep. And Charlie he has Metzl. a, yeah, 
a long-term <laughs> ghostwriter, has written all the books that are labeled John Maxwell. Yeah. You know, John is a fantastic public speaker yeah. and a great connector of individuals. And to be honest, I'm not certain how good of a writer he is. Uh, but if you go back and read uh, his very first book, Think on These Things, you'll discover it. Yeah, well, <laughs> and it and it strikes me like, you know, for for me, you know, working, you know, working with Paul, as we talked about earlier, you know, I once I've written enough that I feel like I've got this, I hate expounding on it. It's not that I don't like writing. Mm -hmm. I will write. Um, but once it's been said, it's been said. And and I and then I that goes through this filtering mechanism, which I can't seem to get out of my own way on, which is eh, that's not important. <laughs> is that really what I want to say? does everybody need to hear it? like and and i start picking it apart to the point where i picked my own work apart and like you know what it doesn't matter and then i stick it on the shelf and one of the most valuable things in, in uh in work with paul uh, with emissary is that he when he writes stuff or when he looks at things that i've written that filter now is delegated to him mm -hmm. and I, and I accept when he says, yeah, we're, this is what it's going to say. I'm like, all right, sounds good to me because it is, unless it's from me, then my filter, uh, becomes the critic becomes a monster mm -hmm. for me. How do yes. you get your, you know, you've written the career factor stuff. You've written another one and, and now you're, uh, you know, you're working on some other, some works as well. How do you handle that writing process? And the criticism that must come up in your own mind and assessing what needs to be said, how much needs to be said and when to stop. Yeah, I, I one thing I've done and, and I had a great experience uh, working with uh, with Paul and, and the team with um, taking 39 podcast interviews and base, basically saying, here's a lot of or if you could refine this for me, I'd really appreciate it. Figure out what's good. Toss the rest. Because it was such a, a large amount of content. Um, and so in that, in that project in particular, that was very helpful because I knew I, I could do the front end content creation of being on a podcast. I happen to like being on podcasts. <laughs> so, uh, you're, you're lucky to get me. Uh, anyway, um, but, but then when I think about the, what I'm looking at it personally targeting through this is keeping in mind the journey I want my, reader to go on. And so I, I would say the same thing, Jason, of, you know, well, I've already said this before or whatever, but the curse of knowledge comes up for a lot of readers and it limits how effectively they can communicate if they just assume, well, everybody knows this or, you know, whatever, and, and then minimize their ideas. And so to be able to really flesh out, like I, in my book, The Career Factors, I don't get to what the career factors actually are until chapter six, because I need to I need to get you to what it took me about eight years to think through and to realize mm. and to research. Now, now that we're on the same page, literally, <laughs> now I can tell you what the career factors are. And now you can take the assessment. So that's where I think giving, giving, holding people is capable, but giving them credit for, I'm going to take you on a journey. And if I parachute into the midpoint of the journey, and I haven't orienteered you to where we are and where we're going. I'm doing you a disservice. Yeah. And that's where I think authors can, can disconnect from the real reason that they write. All the because time. Because they're, they're forgetting that part of, well, eventually I do want eyeballs on this thing. So <laughs> yeah. what, what I want them to feel and, and, and I, why I think that, and this is my personality, my story, Jason, maybe not be yours, but I think what I do, I have a tendency to discount what I have done to discount my experience or to, and to say, oh, well, everybody does this or it's not, you know, not, this isn't rocket science. Why am I bothering explaining this? Instead of giving myself credit, I'm like, I kind of have come on a journey and I've learned a lot of stuff and, and not everyone else is where I am. So I'm going to almost give credit to my journey to, to take a chapter and explain a, a paradigm that I need to break down before moving on, which makes me a better communicator. But the, some of some of the reasons that I've been hindered in that uh, have come from just really 
downplaying maybe my my career motivation or downplaying my message, uh, which I don't think is uncommon for writers. I think the my experience, the things that have become integrated into our lives and our experience and, and our work, our, our thought processes, our relationships, those things are just so well integrated are forgotten. We forget that when we first discovered them and we forget that somebody who's reading our work yes. is just discovering this thing, which yes. is so heavily integrated in our own lives. And yep. it's a disservice perhaps to them when we cut what, when we edit ourselves too heavily, mm -hmm. yep. we edit the discovery, the joy of discovery right out of somebody else's experience. Correct. We have a, a title coming out this uh, spring, late spring, early summer. And the author does both of the naturally coming into it. He, he did both of the things you're describing there, Sam. Mm. On the one hand, a uh, great writer. And yet what I have to help, what I had to help him in the editorial process was to say, okay, you know, this, this is common sense to you. This is every day. This is just how you've learned to live your life. So you're jumping and parachuting into the middle of it without giving something that leads the reader up to that core mm -hmm. principle. Then we can't do that. And on the other hand, right, it's also telling us, oh, well, you know, the, the, I don't need to go and talk about, talk about this. I don't need to go and record all this content and, and tell all these stories, you know, and who wants to hear all that? No, no, no. Yes, they do need to hear the story. You haven't learned anything that, that, that is brand new, right? Nothing new under the sun. You've, but you have lived it uniquely as only you can have lived it. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that has value. That is what will attract the reader in. Oh, this person was there when this happened. This person right. lived through this person watched this and is, and is now um, taking these macro and micro examples and tying them to the same principle that I have yet, I am just discovering as the reader for the first time. Correct. And what um, a gift to the reader that I didn't have to muddle through that myself for her for 15 years as you did to be able to then reach a similar conclusion in 230 pages. Correct. That's the, that's well, why we do what we do. Exactly. Fantastic conversation. Uh, and I don't want to cut us short. But, uh, Sam, you've got the career factors out there. How can people get in contact with you and your continuing work as you help people discover, uh, perhaps what is next for them and how to thrive in this experience of life? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, you can stay in, in touch with what's next for me. Cause I'm, I'm making that up all the time, which is a lot of fun. Uh, you can just head to samfeeney.com, uh, F E E N E Y. And, uh, be able to, to discover, uh, books and, uh, each of the, each of the books has the, uh, there was an assessment, which there usually are. I, I enjoy giving people tools that they can uh, take action on right away. Um, those, uh, book pages will have those links right there, uh, for you to take, uh, go right ahead, um, and start em empowering, uh, your own career motivation, uh, whether you're a writer or someone uh, related to that writing process, uh, I think giving yourself some much needed juice to, uh, your career is a gift that really spreads out into a lot of other areas of your life. Amen to that. Our guest is the legendary Sam Feeney, his website, samfeeney.com. The book is career factors. Sam, it's been great having you on emissary authors. We look forward to ho hosting you again sometime soon. My name is Paul Edwards, my co-host Jason Todd. We will see you on the next episode of Emissary Authors.